Um, what I'm going to talk about is endocrine issues related to X and Y chromosome variations. Um, and my uh, hope is to really give you some background, some physiology, so that when your doctor is talking to you about things, you have some context for it, um, rather than just sort of out of the blue, let's start testosterone. Um, so I'm going to give you a sort of a quick sort of mini medical school version of, of what's happening here. Um, and then I'll also show you some Rocky Mountain wildflowers so that uh, maybe you'll go take a hike while you're here. Okay, so we'll talk about, um, and by the way, this is uh, Columbine. It's the state flower. They're out right now. Um, they're really a magnificent deep blue flower. So, but you've got to get pretty high up to see them. So we're going to talk about hypogonadism mostly, um, which is testosterone deficiency. Um, we'll talk about sort of the physiology and, and why this occurs in uh, Kleinfelters. We'll talk about the benefits and disadvantages of testosterone treatment. Uh, we'll talk about timing of testosterone treatment. Uh, and we'll talk about the treatment options. Um, and we'll briefly talk about treatment of small penis, gynecomastia, then we'll talk about other hormo hormonal abnormalities in KS. And if we have time at the end, we'll talk about whatever else you want to talk about. Oh. OK. Um, it's really too bad this advance doesn't work because I like to walk around. Um, OK, so pituitary gland sits up behind the eye. People used to call it the master gland. It actually is relatively stupid. It's just responding to the brain. I think of it as a hormone warehouse. Um, it's really responding to signals that it's getting from the hypothalamus, which is the lower part of the brain. Um, but the pituitary uh, is responsible for making a variety of hormones. Um, it makes uh, uh, prolactin, uh, which stimulates breast, uh, excuse me, it stimulates the developed breast to make milk, obviously not relevant um, in boys. Uh, the uh, pituitary also makes growth hormone, um, which acts through a a protein called IGF-1 to cause growth in tissues. The pituitary makes a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone, which stimulates the thyroid gland to make thyroid hormones, which are responsible for intermediary metabolism, energy expenditure, you know, how fast your metabolism is going. The pituitary makes a hormone called ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone, which stimulates the adrenal cortex to make the stress hormone. Uh, cortisol, which also has a variety of downstream actions. Um, and what we're going to spend most of our time talking about are the gonadotropins. So these are the hormones, LH, luteinizing hormone, and FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, never referred to by the full name, just LH and FSH. They are responsible uh, to stimulate the, the gonads to make sex steroids, either testosterone in the boys or estrogen in the girls, and to cause production of gametes, or eggs and sperm. OK? Uh, OK, so focusing in on just this one axis, um, we're going to talk about exactly what LH and FSH do. And um, they actually can be distinguished in what they do, and that can be helpful to you and your doctor in understanding testicular function. So here's a sort of a picture, again, of the same thing. So we have um, the gonadotropins, LH and FSH. This is a peptide made by the brain that actually causes these uh, hormones to be released from the pituitary. And um, LH stimulates the testis to make testosterone, okay, specifically. Testosterone then feeds back to suppress the production of LH. So what that means is if there's not enough testosterone, the LH isn't suppressed and it will rise. So an elevation in LH can be a useful marker that there's testosterone deficiency present. FSH stimulates the testis to make sperm. And there's a peptide from the testis uh, called inhibin, which is made by the, the cells that basically generate sperm. And it feeds back to suppress FSH. 
And if there are not adequate numbers of these uh, sperm generating cells, there's not sufficient inhibin and FSH rises. Does that make sense? So LH is telling you about testosterone, FSH is telling you about the presence of germ cells. Now, this is what testosterone secretion looks like, um, and this may be a surprise to you. Um, testosterone rises in the fetus um, into the middle of the second trimester and then falls, and then there's this funny little blip in testosterone uh, in the first weeks to months of life that then comes down usually by a few months of life, but it may be prolonged in some people. And this level is, you know, it's comparable to what you see in an adult. Um, so one of the questions we're going to ask is, is this little testosterone surge important in some way? Um, and if it's not happening in uh, boys with Klinefelter syndrome, is that causing problems? There's then suppression um, of testosterone uh, during this sort of one until puberty. We do not know how that happens. We do not know what suppresses uh, this activity. Um, this is a period of time when your boys are sweet little kids uh, before puberty starts. And then at some point, um, uh, testosterone rises, varies from patient to patient, from individual to individual. You all know that. Some boys start early, some boys are really late. It rises to adulthood and then gradually uh, falls. And yeah, I find myself somewhere on that sort of downward slope on that. Um, so normal puberty is started when there's withdrawal of some system that's suppressing all this, right? It can work. We see it in the baby, and the one week old has high testosterone levels. So the system can work. Somehow it's inhibited. And that's actually the piece that people don't really understand. We're, in, just in recent years, beginning to make some progress on this. So the first thing that happens in normal puberty is, is withdrawal of this central nervous system inhibition. And what you get is the beginning of s little pulses of this protein called GNRH that's being transmitted to the pituitary. Initially starts in the evening um, and then becomes present throughout the day. And in response, you get pulses of LH and FSH being secreted early in puberty. This stimulates the testes, increases sex steroids, and you get the development of secondary sexual characteristics. Okay? and eventually the production of sperm. So the axis is functional at birth. LH, FSH, and testosterone levels in a one-week-old boy are similar to those in a young adult. Then the axis is quiet during childhood. This is what the psychologists refer to as latency. The kids aren't thinking about sex and they're sort of peaceful. Um, the mechanism of this is completely unknown. LH, FSH, and testosterone are present, but very low. Then this axis slowly activates at puberty. LH initially rises at night. So if you measure it during the day, you won't find it. These become larger and more frequent, extend into the day, and the regulation of this is not known. So this is what this looks like. What we see then is very, very low levels of LH and FSH that you can only see by extremely sensitive uh, assay techniques that are not generally used clinically, you then begin to get, uh, oh, this arrow keeps disappearing, you begin to get pulses, they get bigger and bigger, and eventually you have an adult pulsatile pattern. Does that make sense? Okay. And you'll see why that's important when we, when we talk about diagnosis. So the first sign of puberty in a boy is testicular enlargement. The testis begins to get larger. It's not pubic hair. Pubic hair can be caused by secretions from the adrenal gland. Um, so it's this testicular enlargement that's the first sign of puberty in a boy. And it's larger. You, you, your doctor may refer to sizes. They have, may have seen little beads that we use that are sized. So anything above 3 mLs is considered to be puberty. The average age for this is about 11.8 years. 
Pubic hair appears a little later, about 12 years. Penile enlargement, about 13 years. And these are all averages. Boys are, have a big spectrum. Um, growth acceleration occurs relatively late in puberty in boys. It's earlier in girls. Peaks in the latter half of puberty. As I said, however, pubic hair may not reflect the onset of puberty. A lot of boys and girls will have appearance of pubic hair and body odor before puberty starts, and we call this adrenarchy. And this is due to an increase in adrenal androgen production. And these are the androgens that are made. They're different from testosterone. They're weaker, um, but they can cause some changes. This usually occurs at the same time as puberty, but not always. And it can occur earlier. Generally, you see acne, oily skin, some axillary hair, and just a little bit of pubic hair. I like to think of this as a lot of odor, a little bit of hair. <laughs> and I don't know why. For some reason, the adrenal androgens cause more odor uh, than, than testosterone in general. And by the way, this is what the same in girls. Is this more common in sex No, no. This, this? Everybody has this. Everybody has this. Yeah. Everybody has adrenarchy. Uh, almost all boys will enter puberty, yes. Kleinfelters, boys will enter puberty. But adrenarchy has no testicular enlargement, okay? And I tell you this because you may take your kid to the doctor and have them you know, say, oh, look, there's pubic hair, and he's going to say to you, no, it's not puberty yet. This is what's going on. This is just it's a normal thing. It may be difficult, however, in Kleinfelter syndrome to distinguish adenarchy from puberty because not all boys, most of them will have testicular enlargement at least at the beginning, but not all. So this can be a little bit more difficult. We talk about pubic hair stages. Um, this, uh, and again, your doctor will talk about this while I'm showing you this. So Tanner 1 means no pubic hair. Tanner 2 is uh, a little pubic hair at the base of the penis. I like to think of this as if you can count them it's still Tanner 2, okay? Tanner 3, you can't count anymore, but it's not, ah, this arrow. Tanner 3, you can count. You can't count anymore, but it's, uh, it spreads throughout the pubic area. Tanner 4 is almost full filling of the pubic area, but not extending onto the abdomen or legs. And Tanner 5 extends onto the abdomen and legs, okay? So you'll hear your doctor talk about that. We assess this using these beads. Um, and as I said, puberty is a testicular enlargement greater than three. So we have the little blue beads uh, under three, and then everything that's yellow is pubertal. Um, you've probably seen these. This ranges uh, nine to 14 years. The range is the same in Kleinfelters as it is in typical boys. So it can be a little difficult knowing when your child is actually entering puberty or when to expect that to occur. One strong predictor is when did you go into puberty? Either mom, you know, both mom and dad. If, you're t if you relate, your child may, has a very good chance of also being late. If you were early, your child has a good chance of being early. Uh, so this just gives the ages. This is the median uh, age for appearance of uh, pubic hair. Uh, it's about 12 and a half, about 13 and a half um, for Tanner stage two, uh, excuse me, three, and uh, most boys are in Tanner stage five by 15 to 17 years of age. So hypogonadism, okay, so does that all make sense? That's normal puberty. So let's now talk about Kleinfelters. So hypogonadism just means inadequate testicular function, and hypogonadism in Kleinfelter syndrome is primary testicular failure. So the rest of the system I told you about is working fine, it's the testis itself that's not functioning. The central hormones responsible are entirely normal. The testis itself is abnormal and unable to respond appropriately to LH and FSH. So here's an example of a normal testis. Um, and what you see here is these nice tubules. Uh, these here are the cells that actually produce the sperm. Uh, they, if you will, the sperm move their way out, enter this central part of the tubule. Um, 
This is a cross section, so these are you know the squiggly spaghettis that are inside the testis. Sperm move down this um, and into the spermatic duct. In between here are the cells that make testosterone, called Leydig cells. And there are not very many of them. And the vast, the most of the mass of the testis are these sperm secreting cells. So what you see in many boys, older boys with Kleinfelter's is very small testes, but still able to make testosterone because the Leydig cells take up so little space that they aren't reflected in the mass of the testis. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, this is a higher uh, uh, magnification. Again, you can see sperm being uh, sort of transporting out into the lumen of the, of the testis. And here are your lighting cells right here. So this is a Kleinfelter's testis. And what you can see is a real lack of organization. The tubules are now missing. Um, there is uh, fibrous tissue that has replaced these tubules. Uh, there's a lot of fibrous tissue between the tubules. Um, and uh, I don't have a higher power. And so there's a lack of those tubular structures and loss of the cells that are making um, testes. I'm, this is an adult. Yeah. So in Kleinfelter, once pituitary puberty starts, so that inhibition is released, Start making GnRH, start making LH and FSH. The pituitary attempts to drive response from the testis. Sperm cell production is abnormal, so you don't have that feedback from inhibin, so the FSH rises. In many situations, testosterone production also becomes abnormal at some point. Not always at the same time, and not all men have testosterone deficiency, but it's common. When that happens, there's feedback is lost, LH begins to rise. Okay? So you can get a sense of what's happening in the pituitary by the levels of LH and FSH. So when this occurs, and LH and FSH are elevated, we call this hypergonadotropic hypogonadism because it's, there's elevated levels of gonadotropins. Okay? Now, LH and FSH won't be elevated prior to puberty because it's not trying. Okay, there's no stimulus to the pituitary to make LH and FSH. Feedback doesn't matter, and so you don't get this elevation. Now, one way to tell when a boy should be in puberty or when to predict puberty might start is to do what's called a bone age. You sons have had bone ages? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a simple thing, but it's actually very useful. It's not perfect. Um, it's a means to determine degree of development. Puberty generally starts at a bone age of 12 in boys, whether they're 14 or 9. There's that variation in every, you know, typical boys have a big variation. But in fact, their bone ages don't vary. When they start puberty, their bone age will be about 12. They just got there early or they got there late. It's a better predictor of puberty than chronologic age. And LH and FSH are expected to rise only after the bone age, sort of the biological age, has reached an appropriate stage of development. Okay? So bone age delay, however, doesn't diagnose anything. That's important. Okay? It's just a marker. It's like how tall you are, how fat you are, what color your hair is, etc. Funny you should ask. I'm going to show you a picture. Okay. Excellent. Bone age also tells you about the remaining growth potential. So we know from standard bone ages how much of the total height has been attained. So it's also a way to figure out what the growth potential is. So this is how we look at it. These are bone ages, and what we're looking at is the development of the growth plate. So here, you see this little bone here? I hope it projects okay. That's actually not a separate bone. That's one bone, that whole thing, but it's not all calcified yet. Right? So the growth plate is just cartilage. And so it's not calcified yet. And over time, more and more becomes calcified so that this little spot here becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and then eventually fuses with the rest of the bone. And when all that fusion has occurred, like here, the child stops growing. Okay? So that's just an x-ray. And if you go to an endocrinologist, they're going to get a bone age. So when should we start testosterone? Um, 
I, I'll tell you right now, I don't know. Um, I showed you that graph that testosterone is made during fetal life, it's made during early childhood, it's made at very low levels that with, with good uh, sensitive assays you can actually detect even during latency, and then it begins to rise. So should we be replacing this early to imitate that little surge? We don't know. There's no studies that say yes or no to that. It makes some sense if typical boys are doing it, maybe it's necessary. But we don't know exactly what it does. Maybe it should be later in childhood. Maybe we should be replacing some of that testosterone that would be present in latency at very low levels. Maybe there's benefits. Maybe there's cognitive benefits. Maybe there's developmental benefits to the muscle and bone. We do not know. There have been studies looking at uh, replacement of testosterone um, in, uh, uh, in er, a sort of later childhood uh, by Judy Ross at uh, Jefferson in Philadelphia. Um, and I, I don't know that she's published it yet. I know that the study is finished, um, but I don't know that I, I don't think I've seen the data. I'm sure I haven't, but I don't know if I missed it. Um, maybe this would help with some of the complaints of small penis. Maybe it would have some behavioral benefits. Maybe there would be physical benefits of low doses. We don't know. Should testosterone be just started at a certain age? Maybe we should start testosterone at 12 and a half in everybody. That's the age when the average kid is making testosterone and we should just give it. Well, not everybody's going to need it. And you don't know yet whether the, patient, whether the individual is going to need it. And maybe it's too late for some. Maybe it's too early for others because they haven't gotten to that point in puberty yet. We could end up starting testosterone too early. What makes sense to me, just as a physiologist, is that I should ask the body to tell me when it needs testosterone. And I know that when LH begins to rise, the pituitary is not getting the feedback it's looking for for testosterone. So this indicates that the pituitary is trying and failing. So instead of me trying to be smarter than the body, it makes sense to me to ask the body, when are you ready? Okay. Or should we wait until there's actually failure? Whether that's a falling testosterone, signs of falling testosterone such as gynecomastia, and I have to say this is the historical approach. Basically say, well, we'll see what happens. We'll let nature take its course and we'll start if it looks like things are happening. Can't say it's wrong. Doesn't make sense to me to treat something after it's already progressed uh, along the way. You, yes, well, you can use bone age to predict when it's likely to start. Um, I don't know that I'd be so comfortable saying the bone age is 12 and a half, I'm going to start. Because I don't know, because a lot of boys will make plenty of testosterone for the first few years. They may not need it. You just want to start monitoring. Exactly. So what I like, what I like to do is what I call uh, uh, attentive, uh, attentive monitoring, sort of... Um, uh, attentive ignorance. So um, don't make any decisions, but watch closely at that point. So when the bone age gets to the point where I expect this to start, I'm going to start looking closely for signs that things aren't going right. And what's the harm of starting? We'll talk about that. Okay. How often would you, how often would you monitor a boy at the bone age? Six months. Yeah. And I can't defend that. Somebody could say to you, oh, once a year is good enough. I can't say that's wrong. Um, I, I do about every six months. You know. Yeah. 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 Because, because I have seen kids come in, you know, who were missed with gynecomastia that's substantial, uh, and that once, it, once that develops, it's a pain in the neck to deal with, to be honest. So I just don't, why let that happen? Yes. Yes, we'll talk, we're going to talk about that. Um, but the short version is it's the effect of testosterone on those growth plates. So if you don't have testosterone, they don't mature as fast. The bones keep growing longer than they would otherwise. Okay. 
Um, so this is just a graphic, uh, same thing. Do we start testosterone early? Do we start it when, you know, sort of guess that it's rising? Do we start it later on, uh, LH driven, or do we wait until things are failing? Um, I don't know the answer to that. And no one really does, because there are no studies that show this. Now, we are doing a study here that I think I'm going to talk about quickly at the end, um, looking at somewhat earlier uh, starting of testosterone sort of prophylactically to see if that's beneficial to uh, cognitive function uh, and muscle. So let's talk briefly about small penis. Um, so a normal penis has a pretty wide range. Um, any, anything greater than 2.5 centimeters in length or about an inch um, and one centimeter in diameter is considered to be normal in an infant. Um, the penis may be small due to inadequate testosterone production in utero or in early childhood. A short course of low-dose testosterone may be used to promote penile enlargement. Uh, however, therapy is not required for anything except cosmetic purposes. Okay? So people often have questions about that. You don't have to do this unless there's a problem. There's no evidence of effect one way or the other on adult penis size, and it, if you do treat, it may regress and require additional treatment. It'll get bigger. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah, that's the reason to do it, would be if, you know, but the kid was troubled, grandma's troubled, you know, whatever. Um, that's it, not the only reason you're doing testosterone. No, no, this is just for in infants. I should have clarified that. So oh, this is, this is okay. just in infants. Prior, oh, early okay. on in life, okay. some families will come in, not, not just client filters, other, other okay. medical problems okay. will also have this. So you can do this. It's not required. There's no evidence that it has any effect on adult penis size. Okay. I want to talk about gynecomastia a little bit and talk about sex steroid effects on breast development, okay? So the, what are the hormonal effects on breast development? Estrogens stimulate breast development. Androgens, like testosterone, inhibit breast development. So breast development is thought to reflect an increase in the ratio of estrogen to testosterone, okay? That can be caused by decreased testosterone or by increased estrogen. Or a change in the conversion rate of testosterone to estrogen. Okay, so there's a variety of ways you can get there. What causes gynecomastia? Testosterone is converted to estrogen. But it takes only a little bit of testosterone to make a lot of estrogen. Okay, that's the, sort of the key here. So in Klinefelter syndrome, as in other situations, it's not just Klinefelter, a slow rise in testosterone fails to keep up with the early estrogen that's being generated in boys with gonadal abnormalities. Okay? So anything that causes the testis not to make the right amount of testosterone, estrogen will be formed, not enough testosterone is around to balance it, and you get this imbalance of estrogen and testosterone. Now we know that LH promotes estrogen secretion preferentially from the testis. So as the testis begins to fail and you have increased LH, you actually worsen the situation because LH preferentially promotes estrogen secretion. In addition, the weak androgen from the adrenal gl gland called androstenedione is a precursor for estrogen. So if adrenarche occurs because of the adrenal gland production, that becomes now a precursor for estrogen, which happens in everybody. But in typical boys with normal gonads, the testosterone is rising fast enough to balance that. Does that make sense? So this is the cause of gynecomastia and Klinefelter syndrome. It's that imbalance of estrogen to testosterone production. And so it's... If you do it early. You can stop. Yes. You can prevent it and you can stop it and if it's not too advanced you can reverse it. Wow. Okay? But it has to be done, you have to be paying attention. Because once you have, you know, serious breast development, nothing but surgery is going to make a difference. 
So what are the consequences of testosterone deficiency? Reduced body hair, decreased muscle mass and strength, increased fat mass and altered fat distribution, changes in cholesterol, decreased hemoglobin, decreased sex interest and erection, and erection uh, uh, potency, uh, low bone density, and contribute to behavioral problems and depressed mood. The benefits include virilization, outward signs of pubertal development, promotion of normal sexual function and development so that they maintain similarity to their peers, that may contribute to their self-esteem, they don't feel so different. Um, muscle development and fat distribution so they're more like a boy than a girl. And body proportion, so this is what we talked about. So testosterone promotes bone maturation so that the bones don't continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow for a long time, particularly the long bones, which is why you get that kind of long-legged look in late-treated Kleinfelter. And it also promotes growth of the spine so the body proportions are proper. That makes sense? It promotes bone maturation and mineral accumulation so that bone density is not a problem and prevention and treatment of gynecomastia. We don't know the effects of testosterone on behavior. What are the disadvantages? Acne, increased sexual activity, which may be unwanted, based on the, depending on the kid's developmental stage. Increased strength, which can be a problem if a kid's behavior is a problem. Um, and if you start too early, you can cause short stature. So that's the answer to that, because you'll mature those bones too fast. So if you go too fast, or you start too early, you can actually make the kid short. Okay. And I should add that we really don't know the effect of early testosterone initiation on future fertility. As Dr. Rao talked, um, you know, there's both positive and negative effects of testosterone on sperm production. So there's really an open question here about the right way to do this. No, no. Initially, testosterone will cause them to grow faster. But then, uh, yes, so um, that is what causes the growth spurt in puberty, is the sex steroids. So they will grow faster and then stop. So you, what you can do, so if you want, you know, if you wanted to, to stunt this, you could go fast. So that you get up to higher levels quickly and cause... Um, Yes. So you could. Yes. You, you, could, you could discuss with your endocrinologist the idea of getting testosterone started so that you can, you know, decrease the height prediction. But you will see a growth spurt first. I know. Yeah. Probably. Exactly. That, that, that's the reason why people have looked at this. You know, can you, uh, is there benefit to giving testosterone early? We just don't know the answer. Uh, Judy Ross actually used a version of testosterone that's not converted to estrogen. So that wouldn't, that actually wouldn't help the disproportion because it's actually the conversion to estrogen that causes the bones to mature. So that wouldn't actually help in that circumstance. She did it on purpose, but she didn't want to stunt them. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily get that proportion, disproportion fixed. I think you started to say the question, and it, did you say it's unknown with artificial testosterone once you start treatment if it affects sperm development? That's there are both positive, there are both positive and negative effects, and as Dr. Rao talked about, we really don't know the optimal hormonal treatment. Um, so, you know, as a pediatrician, uh, I'm pretty focused on making puberty normal, um, but we don't know exactly the effects on future uh, fertility, right? Okay, we're, we're sort of getting close here. So uh, what I want to do is talk about option testosterone therapy. So this is what testosterone looks like in a normal uh, young man. Um, rises uh, in the early morning and then falls. And what you'd like to do is imitate something like this. Um, but it's, as I'll show you, is a bit hard to do. There are a variety of forms of testosterone available. 
Oral testosterone is not used in the United States to any great degree. There have been concerns about effects of testosterone in the liver um, because when you take a pill orally, it goes immediately to the liver, so the liver sees very high levels of testosterone. Um, this may be less of a concern with more modern agents. There are some that are sort of beginning to appear, uh, but uh, most pediatric oncologists are pretty cautious about this. Injected testosterone uh, is given in oil so that it's long-lasting. Uh, it's given every two to four weeks. The benefits are supervised injections are possible, so you can just, you know, you're going to the doctor's office today, you're getting your injection, or I'm giving it to you, less dependence on the child. It's inexpensive, and you don't have to fuss with it every day. This is purely individual choice. The disadvantages are that effect may be inconsistent over the month, and it requires an injection. So what do I mean by inconsistent? So uh, here um, is a testosterone uh, level in a patient um, given uh, every week, given this is every two weeks, this is every three weeks, and this is every four weeks. And what, I'm, what this is showing you is that the less frequent you give it, the more you get peaks and troughs. High and then down below normal. High and down below normal. If you give it more frequently, you can minimize that, but there's still a lot of up and down in the testosterone. I'm actually on the injection, the self-inject, and what I have is to avoid a lot of the ups and downs. Yeah. There's a modified injection where instead of every two weeks, it's every week I take a CC the first week, yeah. and a half CC each one. So it's never that drop off. Yeah. You're always going from the high to mid. Yeah, it's possible to sort of customize this. It's absolutely doable. People will say, oh, injections are terrible. Um, you're up and down all the time. It doesn't have to be. You can customize it. And also, at the very low doses that we start with, this kind of thing is not a problem. So at the very low doses, in my experience, when you're first starting injections in a, in a child to start puberty, you don't see this problem. As you get to higher doses, people will start to report, I can feel when it's falling. What's considered low doses? So I usually start kids anywhere from 50 to 100 milligrams uh, once a month. It depends on how much of their own puberty they've had. The more puberty they've had, the higher dose I'm going to start with. 50 to 100 milligrams a month. What, what would normal, is a normal way of puberty, do they have the peaks and balance? Yeah, they do, but it's, but it's not, it's smoother. Yeah. That's probably why they sometimes lose it and start crying and stuff, you know. I think that is little changes in hormones. So starting dose, 75 milligrams, 50 to 100. Um, pubertal dose, anywhere from 150 to 200 milligrams once a month. And most adults will take you know, 200 milligrams every two to four weeks. It's very variable, it's very individualized, and you have to work with your doctor, pay attention to get that dose just right for the child. Now, I don't get testosterone levels routinely because it depends where you are in the peak or trough, so uh, that's not as useful to me as how are you feeling? How do you feel a week after the shot? How do you feel two weeks after the shot? So that's going to be more useful to me than some random testosterone level that's dependent more than anything else on when the last shot was. Okay? Now, there are patches. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about them. They're changed daily. Uh, they're, they, they, because they're daily, um, they should be more consistent. Uh, my experience is that uh, they don't, kids don't like them. Uh, they're itchy. They fall off easily. Uh, and I haven't prescribed a patch. Well, I recently had someone ask me for it. Um, the gel uh, is probably the most widely used. It comes as either a fixed dosed pack or a pump. Um, it's applied daily. It should be more consistent than injections because you're doing a little bit every day. Uh, however, um, I find it very erratic. Um, I, it seems to me that despite what it should do, sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low, even when the kid seems to be doing it the same way. I can't predict the dose. Same size person might need one pump or 10 pumps, um, so it's very erratic. You can't give the low doses that you need for early puberty, so we don't use it when we're starting puberty. Um, many people like it. Many people like injections. It's pure personal choice. 
There is a buckle thing that you apply to the lining of your mouth. I have no experience with it. Uh, there are implants uh, I'm, th that, that are out there. I know people have had them. I'm cautious. I don't think we know how to dose it very well yet. I had a patient who needed to get it taken out because it was too much. Um, so I think, you know, once it's in there, you're stuck with it. So I'm cautious. Um, and we talked about the, there's, and there's now a depot testosterone form that I have no experience with that's given every three to four months and is supposed to be uh, more steady. And this is an example of testosterone levels in a patient on a, on a depot testosterone preparation. So serum testosterone, um, uh, you know, for injections, I don't really do it. I think subjective monitoring with good interview with the patient is the most important thing. The families usually will know. He gets so cranky. About four days before the shot is due, he's irritable. He starts to cry. He's melting down more. Um, usually it's obvious. Um, on the gel, needs more monitoring. You get a morning testosterone about a month after any dose change. And once it's stable, you can measure it a few times a year. Although, as I said, it's somewhat erratic. So does testosterone help with behavior difficulties, mood, speech, learning, or motor skills? There's a variety of studies that suggest that maybe. There's a study that shows that there was improvement in mood, attention, social relationships, um, uh, verbal fluency, a variety of things. These are all small studies, and some of them were not randomized. Uh, so we don't really know. Dr. Ross, as I said, looked at uh, low-dose oral androgen replacement in young males um, with SXY. Uh, I've not seen the results of this study. We had a study done here, an original pilot study, 12 to 21-year-old males starting on testosterone replacement therapy for routine clinical purposes, and we just looked at a variety of things before and after treatment as a way to get some data for a grant, and what was seen was uh, some improvements in externalizing, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, acting out, uh, attention problems, and improvements in personal adjustment. This was used uh, as preliminary data to get funding for Dr. Tartaglia for a much larger study that's a placebo-controlled trial of testosterone gel started early in puberty in adolescents with XXY, with the outcome being cognitive function, strength, motor, skills, etc. And I do not know the answer to that. Other hormone problems in KS, hypothyroidism. So again, looking at this same kind of drawing, TSH is secreted by the pituitary, stimulates the thyroid gland uh, to make thyroid hormone, which are called T3 and T4. These have a variety of downstream um, uh, effects. And primary thyroid failure is more common in Klinefelter syndrome. The cause is unknown. And like gonadal failure, as the thyroid fails, the TSH rises. And that's how the diagnosis is made. The treatment is really easy. It's just a pill once a day. Pretty easy to, to, to get the right dose. Other hormonal problems, diabetes, is generally related to excess body fat. Um, so they have a higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes. And low bone density, uh, which has a variety of contributors, um, many of these boys are vitamin D deficient, like all other adolescents. Um, they have low muscle mass and, and low muscle tone. The, muscle, the bone actually is able to monitor how much muscle mass is around and responds to that. So low muscle mass will generally lead to low bone density. Delayed testosterone replacement or testosterone deficiency can promote low bone density. However, over-fracturing osteoporosis is very uncommon. Questions? Um, when you were talking about the type of treatment of testosterone, what is your preferred? Is it, I kind of, you said it's personal. It's but personal. Okay, if you're the... Uh, what I do, no, no what, I, what I tell people is, here's the benefits of injection, here's the disadvantages, here's the benefits of a gel, the disadvantages, which do you think is going to work best so for your child? And you, are the yes, I, I'm not using, I mean, the ax, there's one that goes in the armpit that's kind of interesting. Um, but you know, you've got to understand that for me as a, as a pediatric endocrinologist, I need to be able to deliver low doses. This thing comes as a single fixed dose. Okay. So I, that's an adult dose. So, you know, I need to be able to deliver low doses of testosterone. I'm um, sure most pediatric endocrinologists would use the same. 
In general, yeah. There's very little use of gel in the young, in the young kids. Generic, it's generic, cheap, generic. It's yep. Um, there are different brands of gel. Um, there's three or four now. Um, they differ in how they're delivered. They differ in how they feel. Um, you know, their absorption's a little bit different. The dosing's a little bit different. But they're the same idea. And usually that's driven by your insurance company. Um, you know, Androgel or Testim or you know whatever. That's that's picked by your insurance company. Has anybody looked at nutrition or natural therapies? For, for helping any of these? What do you think the answer to that is? No. Yeah, right. Oh. Yeah. So you said you use LH to predict. I do. What's the number? Oh, the number. So, um, so I, I, a typical LH in an adolescent boy who's, you know, sort of developing properly would be sort of three, four, five range. Um, uh, if I start seeing values in the double digits and persistent, so I'm not going to go on a single value because it's pulsing and I could have just gotten lucky and gotten one of those pulses. So I'm going to want to see that it's persistent. Um, so if I start seeing double digit values that are persistent, I'm, I'm starting to talk to the family so about testosterone. I'd probably check it again maybe in a few weeks to see if I just got a pulse. And I actually recently had a girl who I did an LH and FSH on for a different reason, and it was really high, and I thought, what? Well, she shouldn't. There's nothing about this girl that would have made this be high. And sure enough, a week later, it was normal. So I just got a pulse. And then under earlier, that those tapes start at night. They start at night. And um, how do you measure that? Is there a take-home no, no, you don't measure those peaks. That's, that's just physiology. You just grab it. The, 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 so you got to go in and have a blood test? Yeah, you just go in and have a blood test. Yeah. When you say double digits, you mean like 10? 10, 11, 12. Yeah, that's, that's, not, that's not what you should see. You should not see that. Yeah. Oh, uh, adulthood. Adulthood. I've got, I've got a young man... You know, and if there's usually other stuff going on. That's why they gain so much weight, etc. Uh, but with the low bone, with the low muscle mass, may, may not be very active. This young man was parents were like crazy feeding him all sorts of crazy stuff. He get, became very obese. About the age of 18, 19, he he became diabetic. Um, he was eventually taken out of his home and um, slimmed down, and and he's diabetes is essentially gone. Osteoporosis sometimes. If if patients are being treated appropriately with testosterone, uh, it should not be a big concern. I don't routinely measure bone density uh, because in pediatrics we don't treat it. We only would, we'd only be thinking about doing something if it was actually fracturing. So, you know, make sure the vitamin D is okay, make sure the diet's okay, get them as active as possible. Testosterone replacement at the right time shouldn't be a big problem. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we need to talk about this. I mean, so it's interesting. We do use it for other indications in boys. Um, and there have been concerns uh, in typical boys of ad adverse effects on the gonad when used uh, in early puberty in boys. So we do use it for some things. But it's not something we use very strongly because we're nervous about it in, in, the, in the young child with puberty because of these other problems. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it makes, it makes sense, but again, for other reasons, we're nervous about using aromatase inhibitors uh, in boys. The other problem with aromatase inhibitors is it's going to worsen the disproportion because it will slow the bone maturation. One of the things we use it for is to make kids taller who are short. So that may not be what you want, right? You, you can make the legs longer. So that's the other potential downside in the growing child. So that's different potentially than in the older person. Uh, 
hormone that's what this will do. That's yeah. Sex yeah. Uh, that's a slightly different topic. I don't. And that's really doesn't affect. Well, it does affect SHBG, right? It, it should. Because if testosterone is going up, SHBG should go down. You're going to get more estrogen. It's a long story. But estrogen binds SHBG better than, than testosterone. I mean, opposite. So that you get more free, test, free estrogen around, you can potentially worsen gynecomastia in that circumstance. I mean, this, you, you can't muck around with this. I mean, that's the problem, right? You know, nature doesn't like you mucking around with it too much. It will do something to, uh, to, to try to reestablish the, the perturbation. And so you, everything has two sides to it, is the, is the problem. Yeah, that's, that's a great way, though, to make the legs longer. That, that's, you know, that's, that's the downside. So again, short, short term, uh, it you know, may very well be a useful thing, uh, but it, it, it also has a downside to it. So, it, so it's usually present before puberty, but it tends to uh, become exaggerated during puberty. Um, uh, particularly if puberty, you know, puberty is delayed and testosterone, if, if there's testosterone deficiency, if it's not treated on time, you can get worsening of that proportion, of disproportion. Just a couple more. Back to uh, the, the, the yes. So um, I just recommend um, for all adolescents that they have uh, the RDA of calcium, which is about 12 to 1500 milligrams a day. Um, that's true for everybody. There's not a lot of evidence that higher doses are effective um, and ensure that there's adequate vitamin D. Is vitamin D free? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. They're the same as far as the body's concerned. D2 and D3 are the same. In, in what way? Fertility? As you guys will know, I mean, it seems like there's been a lot learned in the last five years. Yeah. I mean, is it, it, it feels like you guys are on the up. You know, I hope so. Side, uh, yeah, I hope so. Really uh, yeah. learning how to, how to treat. I think we'll have more information about so a lot of this, you yeah. know, earlier initiation. Um, we're not starting, we're starting testosterone in the boys in our trial, you know, not at six or seven. But we're just, what we're doing is starting them uh, uh, as soon as they begin puberty um, rather than waiting for any changes. So we're just looking at, you know, if you um, uh, intervene early, is there a benefit? Whether people are going to start doing it at four, five, six, I don't know. Yes, oh, absolutely. Susan Howell. Uh, yeah, I think they have money to bring people. Uh, yeah, just starting puberty. It's one year. Yeah. Yes. I don't know. Do you know what that number is? No. I don't know because, you know, we may not see them. Um, you know, remember, you know, half, 
half of people with Klinefelter syndrome are, are diagnosed in infertility clinic, right? So they develop normally, everything's fine. So, um, you know, we're seeing the ones that are picked up. So I can't so tell. You know what, I don't know what the predictor is. I mean, I would say in my experience, I can't tell who's going to end up needing testosterone. Some of these boys go through puberty beautifully. They're, they reach nice adult levels of testosterone. Everything is absolutely fine. LH stays normal. I mean, and I can't, I don't know who they are. I can't predict them very well. These are, you yeah. know they have yeah. time problems if they're patients of yours. Yeah. They, and they go through puberty fine. Yet. And whether they end up, you know, in Dr. Rao's clinic because they have testosterone deficiency at 25, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I, I can't pick them out beforehand. <laughs> if I could answer that question, I wouldn't be working. Uh, well, you have more chances of encountering other people who solve the problem than I do. Um, you know, it's a very difficult problem. It's so much dependent on the, the kid. Um, you know, the things that generally you have to think about is tying it to some other behavior that they do routinely so that, you know, if they brush their teeth, then you can tie it to toothbrushing. I've had some kids say, well, I don't do that either. Um, <laughs> well, the benefits, see, the problem with the benefits is they're not going to see benefits day to day. They don't, it's not like a pain medicine where you take it, you feel better, or ADHD meds, you feel it. Yeah, so tying it, supervision, positive reinforcement, uh, uh, rewarding, I mean, all those things that you would do to promote uh, a, a positive behavior, um, but it depends on the it depends on the kid, what's going to work. You know, for some kids it's simple as setting an alarm on their phone because they they mean to do it and they just forget that works. For other kids, the alarm goes off and they go, oh yeah, okay, and they go on about their business. So um, it it varies. I, I don't. I wish I had an answer for you, except to, I don't know. I mean. <laughs> or yeah, I mean, you know, that's why some families choose injections. That's, that's, that ends up being the reason. Or some of the kids hate the gel, they just, the, the, the texture thing, the sensory thing, they don't like it. Um, but, you know, that's why. Now, what could be good for taking the injection or whatever the medication is, is start a daily logbook versus when they're on the medication, on the testosterone, how are they feeling and all that. And then they go off of it, they don't want to take it, record how they're feeling day to day. Yeah as it declines or this or that, and then they can look back and see, this is how I'm feeling, this is how much better I'm doing on the treatment than off of it. That'll work, so for, that'll work for some kids, some, right? Not. Some kids who are, you know, you're an adult, 15 year olds don't, aren't uh, very good at connecting right. consequences. Um, some kids, you know, it's, it's that executive function, even keeping the log mm -hmm. wouldn't happen. Right, so you know it depends. Everybody's different. That's why I can't really give an answer. What's going to work for your child's behavior style, personality style? Um, some kids are sufficiently sort of you know compulsive about things that keeping a log is useful. They can make those connections. Some kids won't. Will keep the log for two days, and they'll stop. Um, so that's not going to work. You know, you have to know your kid. With regards to the application of the underline, yeah, I know nothing about it. Do you? Yeah. Is underarm deodorant? Is it not? Or it's not deodorant. It's, but it's like deodorant. Okay, so it's like like deodorant, so it's not like an additive to deodorant. No. So it would be a second process of putting mm. on underarm. I think it might make body odor worse, but I don't know. Uh, I, I don't, I just don't know. Yeah, men in general stink. <laughs> no, I'm just, just a couple more because I actually have to, to run, so. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, my son is already gone from puberty. He's yes. 12. Um, oh. I believe he's a or 6, but his hair on Five. Five is as far as it goes. Okay. Yeah. One of the things she said six is when hair goes to your belly button. Five. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Oh. And I'm a little concerned, is there any guideline paper that I can share with the endo to show him 
Uh, I'm not actually aware of guidelines like that. Okay. Um, your endo should know that. Second opinion. Second opinion. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I, I'm afraid I have to go to another point of thinking. <laughs>